Hi, my name is Jocko Vandekoy. I'm the CEO of Winning by Design. And I love music. Oh, and I also love sales. Yes, I do. And today I'm going to share with you the data model and what we can do with the data model. You ready? Now, over the past weeks, we have been talking about a few of these business models. I don't know if you, if you have followed us on our YouTube channel, but up to this point, we have been discussing these three models, the business model, the GTM model, and the growth stage model. And as promised, we will step model by model, and we're gonna go through all of them. The next one up is the data model. That's where we're going to start today, the data model. And I want to share with you of some of these changes that have occurred over the past uh, years. Now, what we see into this data model is that historically we are used a funnel. This funnel that all of you know, it's a little bit historic, okay? Yeah, that's kind of historic. Okay, and what we see in this model that is being put together by crystal ball, sages, it feels like wizardry, okay? And this wizardry is applied to different parts. That is, as we are using like some magic to turn uh, prospects into pipeline. That makes many of us think that it's an art. Now what we see here in this art is divided in three uh, pieces, three parts. Pipeline conversion, often done by sales. Uh, pipeline development, done by teams of prospecting or by content or by marketing teams. And uh, pipeline creation, often done by the, mar by the marketing function. But I have to tell you, it is time to move on from this. This approach to looking at customers as if we are generating revenue and we are just popping them out is outdated. And that's why we're going to take a look at the new model. And this new model has a relatively new approach. Where do we go from? Where do we go from? We're going to look at what we call the bow tie. No one can save us. And this bow tie is based on science, both on proper modeling. The idea is that you don't want to lose a customer once you've signed them. You want to keep them with you and you want to help them achieve the impact that they wanted from you. That's it. We want them to be craving. They want them to love with us. I just want to see you on my new grave before Yes, yes, yes. And so what I'm going to take a look at is I'm going to take you, take you through what a modern funnel can look like. Now a modern funnel is based on these five key elements. We're going to, the four key elements. I'm going to take you through how it's full funnel, how it has closed loops in there, how it is customer centric, what specific data we're going to measure, and I'm going to share with you some findings. So let's get going on that. Well, we're going to see that historically the, the bow tie our, our, what we're looking to complete is making it full funnel. I'm going to draw from this single funnel. What we see down here is not full. I'm going to tip it to its side. Boom. And we're going to see that that process historically is there to sell products to customers. Think of routers. Think of like, yeah, like equipment and so on and so forth. Now, what we see here at the left, and we have prospects coming in on the left and closed one deals on the right. In order to close them, we have a very seller perspective. We call about negotiating, targeting, winning, objection handling, selling, and so on. And all that is, it is as if we are focused at closing the deal and being done with them. Now, in order to do, we take them to three stages. Those stages are create the awareness. You know what? It could be with a billboard. It could be with an advertisement in a magazine. It could be with content online. It could be with targeting them with content on LinkedIn based on persona. 
What we then do is we see educate them. We educate them with content. What are the options to have them learn more about the problems they're running into, to have them learn more about the solutions that are out there. And then what we see is they're going to make a selection. They are going to deem this is important. And once it is important, it becomes a priority. They're going to spend money and resources in order to achieve the desired impact. That is from a very customer perspective. Hey, I become aware, I educate, I become educated, and therefore I now know what I want and we're going to make a selection and come to a decision. What is still here at the bottom is prospects to sell to and close one. That is still very seller centric. Imagine what this is like. It feels like there's an end. Once I close here, close one, boom, the end. Thank you very much. Can you imagine? Let's pay the end credits. Thank you for the, thank you for coming people. We close the deal. Good luck. See ya. Bye bye. This is not what business is like. For those of you who've been long in sales, you know, you know, your relationship with your customers is often what you take, what you keep way longer than your relationship with the companies you re represent. Now, that means that we need to make this seller, per seller perspective. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lean a little bit in on the journey and say like, hey, we started there, we come to an end. How can we change that? Well, we need to change that by not thinking about prospects as people we sell to, but as prospect as people who we can help achieving impact, who can benefit from it. And there's no end, what you see down here, that is not a close one deal, but instead like a relationship, it is a start of a commitment. We are mutually committing to something. Now, this makes it no longer the end to stay in the movie theme. The end of the movie, we're just entering the intermission. Get your popcorn, get settled, talk a little bit about the, you know, like what you think who did it in the movie, because it is gonna get on. And what you see down here, you know, like I don't know about you, but whenever I'm in a cinema, I saw the other day Tenant, great movie. But what I found is that, you know, like your popcorn, yeah, I'm, you know, you're done with the popcorn even before the movie starts. Sidebar, 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 you know, like little I can, uh, I can say about that other than. Okay, good. What we're now going to do, we're going to go continue that journey. So no longer is there an end. We'll come back from intermission. Now what? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to see that there's an entire new funnel coming to the right. And that right we're going to focus on right now. Where do we go? That is really where we're going. That is where we're going from here. Okay. I want you to realize that's the one that we want. That's where we're going to go to. Now, in order to do that, I'm going to make sure that we're going to go through a few stages that actually are really similar to what we see on the sales side. These three stages that we're going to go through is activate slash onboarding. For people who are selling applications, think of a Chrome plugin, that's activation. But if you sell a CRM platform or a security platform, you're probably thinking about onboarding. Now, sometimes that can take you know, minutes, seconds, days, weeks, months, but it's going to end up with the client having a working platform. A platform that works at Advertise is delivered as promised within budget and on time. Now, what we see, once that platform application is performing, it delivers the impact that the client wants. That impact is the reason why you start a recurring revenue stream. And as you grow your business, you achieve the maximum impact over the lifetime value of that client. That means that on the right, the, the vertical axis depicts the impact that was delivered, the maximum impact. And on the left, the total available market is not like how many people are out there, but how many people your product can impact the business. That creates a full funnel approach, as I promised that I would demonstrate to you. Woo! We now know the bow tie is a full funnel. It's full funnel. It goes marketing, sales, prospecting, customer success, onboarding, account management, everything. Next, what I'm going to step into is explain to you how there are loops inside that full funnel, where there are loops, creating occasionally a closed loop system. Now, what we're going to take a look is we're going to take a look at the same model as you see down here and you see the client journey as the client maneuvers through stages, you know, like uh, meetings, discovery calls, demonstrations, proof of concepts, dependent on the size of the deal and whatnot. As it comes through that journey, it ends and you know, like the first thing that I start to notice is, is this journey really linear? Look at that. Is it linear? Second is, is like, hey, 
My gosh, is there only one way we can go? And the third question is, is this truly the end? Is there no more? This is the end of it? What you see here is a closed loop and this loop creates a feedback on the end of a customer. Think of it as an NPS score where a happy customer generates through a recommendation, a new lead. You can mimic this, you can create your business, you can create processes where you learn who your best customers are and start you know, like acquiring them that way. So for example, if you think of a customer that you really, really like, who has brought you and who uh, lots of other customers, they were like one of those customers that unlocked a whole bunch, a whole new segment of customers. Had you known that at the beginning of the journey, you would have been probably willing to spend a lot more you know, marketing dollars and sales support dollars on that to acquire them. Acquiring those kind of clients would, would find you willing to increase the client acquisition cost. That creates a, a form of a closed loop system if you would know that. Now, what is closed loop? And I wanna draw this analogy down here. A closed loop can be th thought of when you're driving your car. It was not too long ago that you can create cruise control and cruise control is where you essentially like, you start you know, like programming the speed of your car. There's no radar in your car and when you program it at 65 miles an hour, it will going 65 miles an hour until you run out of gas. And in the beginning that was quite fine or bump into something. Yes, I get that too. And so, you know, like that is cruise control. You program the speed. Now, that is an open loop system. It is not responsive to what is happening all around it. Now, what I'm going to create is I'm going to create a closed loop system. I'm going to create some feedback loop in there. That feedback loop I'm creating through radar. And when I use radar, I'm measuring the, 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 the distance to the next car. And as I see that distance decreasing, I'm starting to adjust speed. That is a closed loop system. Now I can go very wicked with this because what you can see is what is now the difference and how are we going to apply artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence most of the time requires a closed loop system. If you do not have closed loop systems, there is no you don't even need to talk about AI. There's just a little use for it. Our AI learns from closed loop system. That's the whole nature from learning on itself. And as I let you read these blocks here, you're going to learn what a closed loop system is. Most of the time, we're not looking at closed loop systems inside marketing and sales, uh, sales operations. Almost always they're open loop. And at best, what we're going to see is some automation. And that is what you see depicted down here. Almost all systems in the market are open loop systems. Now, what we start to see when AI starts to play, think of Amazon, recognizing what you buy, applying what other people have bought, adding your spending power, time a day, all that, and then trying to create a closed loop system. In other words, making you a prospect for a new product to sell. These loops you know, create smaller closed loops and what you see down here is these loops. In this case, for example, we see a loop like this in, in the sales department. Think of in the sales department where a seller is progressing from discovery to demo to may, may, maybe a proposal, but then runs into a person, a senior executive who says like, hey, where are we spending money on? And that executive needs to go through, hey, what was the discovery process? Give me a demo before they approve. Therefore, they go back into the, the sales journey. This going back and forth creates little loops. Most CRMs are not very well suited for this. If you think of that, it means that you move your CRM forward from stage to stage to stage, and you're, let's say you're in the proposal stage, and then suddenly you would reset it back to stages to discovery mode. You know, like people in the organization would see that as if your opportunity has decreased in likelihood. It has improved because it essentially steps through with a senior decision maker. This is an indication that modern today's CRM systems are incapable of registering what is truly happening in the deal. And it just puts it into an advanced mode such as navigating the organization or creating decision approval or something like that. Where in true fact, it is stepping with the executive decision maker through the discovery and demo process.
There are other loops and what the loops that you see down here is the nurturing loop. This is a more well-known loop where you know, we keep nurturing content to the database until they you know, surpass a certain threshold and expressing interest to buy, whether that is by contacting us or whether that is by visiting, for example, a pricing page or something like this. This creates a loop down here and that is called the nurturing loop. The problem with this nurturing loop is that we have hit it so hard over the years that people are really overwhelmed. And so this has become less valuable in many organizations where we see that the marketing material being distributed during this process has gotten at such a volume that it no longer triggers truly interested people. Now, this gives us a start. There is one more loop and it's the most exciting loop of all. Here it comes. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the growth loop. This is what we're doing this for. And when I say we, I do not mean the selling organization. I mean, all of us are working towards this. This is the growth loop and it creates compound growth as you will see in, la in, in, in later models that I'm gonna describe. Now what you see down here is a client, you know, you're achieving the impact and ready to buy more impact. Either they can expand the contract for another year, they can put more users on it, they can buy new products from you. This creates a growth loop. Yes, yes, yes! This growth loop is what this business is about. Now, what you've seen down here, what I've done, we now have the bow tie full funnel model. In that model, we start to see the customer journey. The customer journey is the journey that they take full of experiences and they make loops and bounces. They go one way, they go, go two ways. And hopefully in the future, when you do your job well, they create closed loop systems. That is what we're looking for. Next step that we're gonna talk about is how to create customer centricity. Because up to now, when we're looking at it, we still do not know what are we selling. Yeah. So time to get going on the customer centricity. And this is one of the most exciting parts. Now what I'm going to take you through is we're going to once again use that baseline model, the bow tie. The bow tie again is full funnel, goes from all the way to marketing, through the sales of prospecting, sales organization, onboarding, customer success to account management. What we noticed is where the power of that growth loop was, where it created recurring revenue. And our intent as sellers in SaaS organizations, as sellers anywhere, we, when we sell to a customer, we love them to buy more. This is referred to as recurring revenue. It can come from an existing hardware contract where a customer buys this similar routers. It can come from software sales as a service, it is a software as a service. It can come from anything. Now, what I'm going to do is once that client starts creating more and more recurrence, it at a certain point in time achieves the maximum revenue possible. The client either graduates out, you know, like in, let's say it's over five, six, seven years, we now have achieved lifetime value. Now, the key here is the following. Look at the top. Okay, that's the point. Recurring revenue is the result of recurring impact. Let me repeat it. Recurring revenue is the result of recurring impact. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a success to all of your SaaS business to understand that recurring revenue is the result of recurring impact. Why don't you arrest me right now? Because that essentially is the key metric of all, okay? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, I have too much. <laughs> Good, I'm gonna start another beat. Uh, sorry, I'm having too much fun. <laughs> okay. <sighs> so we want to achieve that recurring revenue. Now I want you to take a look. If recurring revenue is the result of recurring impact, that means that they are interchangeable. 
Look at that bottom right, okay? I'm gonna gray it out over there. Recurring revenue and, re and maximizing revenue. That can be exchanged with the following. If I achieve recurring impact, I can tell you we're gonna get recurring revenue. And if we achieve maximum impact, then we're also going to achieve maximum revenue. In other words, in order to achieve all this revenue, we simply gotta deliver the client the impact that we promised we would, like. Yeah, I mean, I, I cannot make it any simpler than that, right? I mean, dude, you bought an Uber ride and it dropped you off exactly where you wanted to at the time you, you really wanted to. Voila, which is French for there, you see? And so I'm telling you, it's that simple. Now, in order to be able to deliver that impact, I'm going to go upstream. I'm going to go in reverse. I'm going to go back into the funnel. Now, before I do that, I forgot, you know, impact has two kinds, what we call emotional impact, which is, you know, what you normally measure. It's a form of an, an NPS score. Customer expresses love for you and rational impact, which is money, um, you know, more seats, more increased usage and so on and so forth. These are two kinds of impact. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at the causality. That means I'm going to go upstream and says, before I can achieve recurring impact, I got to first be able to achieve impact. A client is ready to, in other words, I need to onboard them. Now, before I can get them onboarded, I need to probably get them committed before I assign resources. So I need to get a mutual commitment signed. And before I do that, I probably in the sales process need to engage them in a conversation around what they want to achieve. What is the impact that they want and demo that impact. Then if I go further upstream, what we consider a lead is like, it's a person who expressed to learn more about the impact that you can achieve in that. And if I go further, then actually a prospect is somebody whose business I can impact. That is the simplicity of this. This is it. It's not more complex. Now what you see down here, calling your customers prospect lead opportunities and so on is still a bit seller centric so we're going to change that now the great thing is the answer to what we should call it is staring us literally right in the face if we remove all those seller centric words then you're going to see in there you're going to see someone who identified somebody who expressed interest, somebody who was engaged in it, somebody who's committed to it, a client ready to achieve it, a and so on and so forth. Simply, if we highlight those words, we will get to what we are actually doing and how valuable it is. Now I'm going to see identified, I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna take that to the top, and over there I'm gonna create what you ref would refer to historically as the customer journey. A client, we identify clients whose business we can impact. We create awareness about the impact we provide. They become interested. We help them with education on the problems, the solutions, the different options that they're having. They become very engaged. As they go through the engagement process, they are picking a choice. They may be, we may be one of two or three options. It may be bet between us and a competitor. It may be between us and no action, it's not deemed you know, to be you know, needed enough, or it may be in an alternative way. These are all options. Finally, they commit and as they commit, you know, like they need to, to activate that, you know, like in a platform, it may take a week to get the platform onboarded or in case of activation, it may take a few seconds. You click, you install and so on and so forth. Once the option is enabled, the Chrome uh, uh, browser plugin is working. You start to achieve the impact that you want and you achieve the impact every day, every hour, every minute, every week, whatever it is, as you expand it, as you like it, you start to expand it. You want more of it. You renew the contract weekly, monthly, annually, quarterly, whatever it is, you buy more and you eventually end up at maximum impact. That is the impact journey all along. You do it every day in your life. You do it whether you buy from Amazon, Starbucks, Uber, Lyft, everywhere. It's the same journey. All you do is, hey, I pay you for something, deliver me for that what I pay you for. It is that simple. Now, I want to highlight some change in here. In the middle of there, for many of you who run into a platform sale, you create a little you know, gate there. And it says like, hold on, I'm not going to let everybody through. And the reason why that is, is because once you pass through this gate, and this is often where the sales professional accepts uh, the client into their funnel, the client is going to get access to, a, for example, uh, experts, uh, executives at the company, 
proof of concepts, uh, you may start spending lots of time and energy on responding an RFP or an RFQ. All that takes lots of effort and as a result, you're increasing the client acquisition cost. For you to access that, we need to make sure that the client is ready. We refer to that as a form of priority. Historically, we use that gate as if you have budget. That was a historic. That's no longer needed because SaaS contracts often fall within budget and budget should already have been tackled long ago. SaaS companies are not buying because they don't have budget. Budget actually is not that important. Next, what we did, the second generation people, they made a decision based on an ROI model. Do we provide enough return on your investment? However, when we looked at the ROI model, SaaS pricing, by the very nature of it, is priced at the fraction of what historically was the perpetual model. That means that we always have a positive ROI. Dude, we just dropped the cost to 20% as if you bought the software up front. We just dropped it by 20, from 100% full, you know, like perpetual software license to a SaaS contract, you know, like whatever. We went from a million dollars a year to $20,000 a month. You bet you that the ROI is skyrocketing. Now, you're not selling just against uh, a client with, uh, with perpetual software or with hardware. You're selling against all kinds of other SaaS providers. So your ROI model doesn't make sense anymore. SaaS contracts and today's contracts are sold on, is this a priority right now? And the priority is based is, do I want this impact at this given point in time? If I look to a traditional ROI model, it doesn't take into account the element of time. It just says there is a need. And when we provide this, there is, you know, like it's a positive uh, uh, um, outcome. We deal with priority because you are selling against 20 other SaaS providers who have an equally important ROI model that has a 10x. And so you have to determine as a buyer or as a buyer has to determine, is this a priority right now? Keep that in mind. This is a whole different world we're selling in today. You like? Okay, that was a lot, okay? I, yeah, like there was a lot of nuggets in there that I want you to think about. What we now here see, or what we now see here, is a bow tie framework that we are gonna build a data model on. We need this because if I didn't build a proper framework first, then our data model wouldn't make sense. I first need to put in the proper fundamentals. Is it customer centric? Does it deliver what the client wants? Otherwise, I'm just gonna have a, you know, a limited data model, but now, I have a proper data model or the, the fundamentals and I can start building a data model. I'm just having too much fun. Don't you see what I see? Folks, this is what sales is about. We think that sales is about closing and objection handling. These are secondary skills. Learning what your customer really wants, the impact they want to achieve. That is the real art, real, what we refer to as art of sell, but it's just a science. Learn what your customer wants and deliver what they paid for. I'm telling you, I love what I do and I love to share it with you. I just hope it's, you're not like, you don't think I'm weird or anything. Okay, this now gives us the opportunity to actually build the data model, okay? Now it's time, let's build this data model. We now have full funnel, marketing, sales, customer success, prospecting, onboarding, uh, account management, everyone. We now, it's closed loop, it has a nurturing loop, it has sales loops, it has growth loops, it's looping everywhere. It is customer centric. It is built to deliver the client the impact that they want. Now what we can do is we can start building the data model. I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna step you through three different metrics. Starting with the first metric, volume metrics. 
Now, what you see with volumetrics is things we measure in volume. Think of how many leads do we have? How many opportunities are in the pipeline? How much revenue? What is the total weighted pipeline? These are all things we measure. How many uh, seats do we have active? How many customers do we onboard? You know, like have we onboarded last week? Volume metric. And one of the most common volume metric is how much recurring revenue? MRR, as in monthly recurring revenue, or AR, as in annual recurring revenue. So let's take a look at what those data models look like. What we see down here is we're taking a bow tie, and I'm gonna look at the bottom, and I'm gonna define volume metrics. Look how they map up against the top, against like identified and interested. They all map to that, okay? That's where I'm gonna go. So now, what I'm going to see is different go-to-market models map call their volume metrics differently. In case of a two-stage sales organization, what you see down here, they're calling that MQLs and SQLs and so on and so forth. Now, if the contract closes annually, then you're going to see ARR. What you see, for example, with product-led growth, it, it operates at a different speed. It's often, you know, talking about the sales cycle measured in days where a platform that uses a two-stage sales organization, SDR and AEs, often are using, you know, sales, you know, measured in, you know, like weeks or sometimes even months. And so down here, what you'll see is they use different metrics, sign up instead of MQLs and product qualified lead and so on and so forth. Because those contracts, in this case, I assume that they're signed on a monthly contract, you're going to see MRR as measurement M7. Now, that may be very different, for example, if we are using a an, an field sales organization. And in this case, this field sales organization is targeting and using qualified accounts instead of leads. You know, like sales qualified accounts that are getting access to, to advanced resources. In this case, most likely because, you know, like of the bigger deal size, they're going to sign annual contracts. And that's the reason why you see those metrics there. The point down here is, is this data model, the volume metrics need to be defined up front. And that is a great place to start for you. What are your volume metrics? How have you defined them? And this is a key because it provides the fundamental basis for us measuring what we're going to do. Now, as you measure, you know, as you create the process, you're going to find that, you know, it looks something like we have done here for one of our clients. At the top, you see your bow tie funnel, and then you are measuring your metrics. What is my MQL or what is my, you know, marketing qualified account uh, definition? What is my, how do I define a win? Is that a signed commitment or is that clicked on, you know, like a form that we have activated the account? All these need to be defined. This process of defining, we recommend that you do that as a team. And then once you experience that, you're going to find it's so great to do that. What I want to point you to is a mistake you will make. And that mistake is where you are starting to look at exceptions. Yes, but what if this and that? I know I've been through many of these. Don't spend 80% of the time discussing the exceptions, okay? Keep it simple. Let the exceptions take care of itself later on. Don't try to be all inclusive with every uh, exception condition that you can identify. What I now have is I can define the time metrics. Now the time metrics, you know, we have used historically, we have only used a, a few very common time metrics. The most common time metrics is sill cycle. And we still don't know when we start measuring it and, and so on and so forth. Now, the sales cycle is often can be determined as the moment in time that the sales professional in charge of you know, helping that client uh, come to a mutual commitment, that they do that the length of time needed for that. Um, the other one is time to live. You know, like for an application, a, a Chrome plugin, for example, that may take seconds. Whereas, you know, like for product-led growth, you know, uh, that may take, you know, like a, a few minutes. And for, you know, installing, you know, entire CRM and replacing existing systems may take months. You know, these are a few of the metrics. What you've already noticed is that sometimes we talk about MRR, ARR. That depends on your contract. So we know, are we going month to month or are we going year to year or quarter to quarter? These are all the different metrics of time. And so you see down here, the delta T indicates the time difference. Conversion metrics work exactly the same. Now, what you see here is the, or historically, the conversion metrics we were using. And it's even more three-letter acronyms. Because there weren't enough.
Okay, now with these more metrics that we're having, these stand for uh, lead to opportunity and opportunity to close. These are historic metrics. The problem with these metrics was they were not, you know, they didn't give us the, the level of granularity that we needed. So we needed to close closer, typically because some of our higher velocity, velocity business, those metrics up front are really important. And so what you see down here, we define for that higher velocity business, we are defining, you know, like more resolution, converting or looking at the conversion metric of prospect, in this case, for example, to MQL being CR1 and conversion rate two from MQL to SQL in, from clients who are interested to client being engaged being CR2. We do the same thing with the opportunity to close. Yes, like I said, more three letter acronyms. And in here, we're defining two conversion rates. This conversion rate CR3 is often referred to as the handoff rate. It's the, in this case, the prospecting person often referred to as an SDR, sales development rep, handing it off to the AE. Then that AE, account executive, sales manager, closes and that is the close, the win rate is CR4. Now what we want to make sure is that if I look down here at T4 at the bottom, this is essentially the sales cycle. You always want to make sure that that sales cycle measures, uh, aligns with the, 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 the win rate. Sales cycle and win rate go hand in hand. You cannot measure win rate from this particular metric down here and sales cycle from another. They are measured across the exact same time span. That is a key and you can see here why that makes sense. That means that this line, for example, is an important line down here because as I said a second ago, that is the line that depends sales cycle and in this case, we, uh, the um, uh, sales cycle and win rate are along these lines. Now, let's take a look at what other metrics are and these met metrics are very, you know, like I said, very, you know, defining in two-stage sales organization where a prospecting person hands off the deal to a, to a seller. These give us the four you know, match specific metrics, the acquisition based conversion metrics. We're now going to take a look at the retention based conversion metrics. Historically, we looked at churn, but churn by itself is not defined enough. Most sales organizations are looking at things like revenue churn and so on. What we say is before we go there, let's split up first what is the onboarding churn or retention and what is the uh, usage churn and retention. That is what you are see that these two are really, really different. Now, onboarding churn, you know, involves with buying remorse, you know, may have been a wrong sell, or less should not be accounted necessarily to the customer success organization. They may very much relate to the sales process. Whereas the logo churn, license churn, and revenue churn, license refers to the seats, logo refers to obviously the entire client being lost, revenue leads to the revenue per client uh, being decreased. And license means like, hey, I'm losing seats. My average revenue per seat is going up, so I don't have revenue churn, but I got l fewer seats to you know, make an impact on their business. These are three very different metrics. It gives a very different definition. We are looking closer to the resolution that we're going to. I need to make sure that you understand that we measure churn. Churn is often like 2%, 3%. And we are measuring this as part of our calculations as retention. In other words, 4% churn equates 96% retention, one minus churn retention, in order to put it all in the same mathematical domain. The same we see here at the, uh, at the, at the end, expansion, upsell, growth, and pretty much always similar kind of terms that describing, am I selling more? Am I creating more impact for my client? When we take a closer look, we refer to that metric as CR7, the growth metric, the expansion metric. And it is defined in four different ways of growing. You get renewing, same contract, same decision maker. Reselling, same contract, new decision maker. Upselling, same person selling more stuff, same department selling more stuff. And cross-selling, selling to other departments. Four very different metrics. Now, if you're running a two, three million dollar recurring revenue operation, this is all the same. But if you're generating 60, 70, 80 million dollars of revenue, uh, you know, just for a shock uh, and, and awe a month, then these metrics have different departments, different organizations, different, you know, like, like, like uh, ways of managing them. I want you to think about that. What you see down here is the old and the new form of data of, 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 of conversion metrics 
side by side where you see that the refined customer success metrics are have a lot more detail to them than just churn and upsell that's the point there's a lot more to it those create the conversion metrics and we refer to them as conversion rates cr1 to cr7 this creates a data model in which these three metrics look like this And this is always this. Once you use this model, we can, as you'll see in the next model that we're going to describe in the next video in, in, in the near future, I'm going to show you that I can now apply mathematical formulas based on this model. If I don't have the data model, I cannot apply mathematical formulas. Now, what you'll see here is what I'm going to next. And the final part is I'm going to step in and we're going to talk a little bit about what can we do? What are the findings that we have, okay? Woo! Let's stretch! Gosh, my neck is getting stiff. Let's do this. I'm ready, you ready? Are you ready? Woo, the last uh, part of this uh, video, we're gonna go into three uh, specific uh, cases. We're gonna start off with benchmark data. Benchmark, compare, here we go. What we now have, because we have the data model, we can start comparing customers against each other. And what we notice is that based on annual contract value depicted here on the left, we notice that there are certain trends. These trends can now be you know, observed and can be applied. That's there. So annual contract value of $10,000 versus $100,000 has different conversion rates. Okay. Now take a look at that as I explain what happens here. What you'll see down here is that the conversion rate is mapped to awareness and education. And these are the two metrics I said before. Now, what it creates, it creates typical annual contract territory, anywhere from 20,000 to all these large, large dollar values, that's annual contract. And what you see here is in those annual contracts, what you are expected in conversion rates, all the way from CR1 to CR2. And if you see down there, CR3 and 4 with, this, with the subtitling here at the bottom, indicating handoff and win rate. There you have it. Yes, 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 that's what we're doing there, okay? Now, those are typical annual contracts. What I'm going to do next here is I'm going to also say, hey, those annual contracts, they generally are exponential growth, I explain that next time. But here, where's territory for compound impact is these contracts that come in at the lower ACV. That is where you see compound impact territory, primarily because the renewal cycle is monthly, therefore, if I compound the things, I compound them per month. So a three-year contract compounds 36 times where versus an annual contract, which compounds over three years at the, at, at the compound factor of three. So that is that benchmark. The key down here is we can compare where you're at. You're gonna, we're gonna come back to that in a little bit. Now, what we're going to do is I'm now gonna apply this data model to different go-to-market models. I'm gonna show you some of the findings that we are now seeing based on this data model. Now, I was struck the other day when I noticed that I saw a blueprint, how, you know, you know, for me, these two things start to look very similar, right? That, you know, like, and I know it may not, you know, like, Jaco, you're, what? Say what? You know, you're a little like uh, loop de loo right? Because you may not see it, but I see these things as being very similar. So having done that, I just thought that I, you know, like share with you some of, of what we see down there. Okay, if I see that, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna only take to the acquisition. I'm gonna only take a look at the acquisition because I gotta. I need some space on the right here. Okay, so on the right, I'm gonna use some space. But now, what I'm going to, to depict is a standard go-to-market model. I'm gonna create volume use of volume metrics in a one-stage sales organization. My marketing campaign is measuring volume of MQLs. Very standard. Very straightforward. Then I'm gonna qualify those MQLs. I'm gonna put them to a disco demo. And what I'm measuring key performance indicators are volume of demos and conversion of MQLs into commit. 
Now, these are good metrics. I may even start measuring if I now turn it. Look, I'm turning it into a two-stage sales organization. Now, my SDRs in this case, you know, I have one group that is going to qualify those leads and one group that is going to close them, get them to a commitment. Okay, you see down here, conversion is split up. And so now measuring my MQL to SQL metrics, my conversion rate there, and my conversion rate of SQL to wins. Then, because I notice that there's a handoff, I give them a little bit of handoff rate. Now look at what I'm measuring on the right. I'm measuring volume of MQLs, volume of demos provided, conversion rate, conversion rate, and handoff rate. These, be these become my key matrices. These are how I'm gonna measure performance indicators. And as I, you know, like go further to the right, I may even think about like, hey, I'm gonna do outbound prospecting. No longer am I gonna go inbound from here. I'm gonna go outbound. When I go outbound, I'm gonna create, you know, number of emails and calls. Look at the top. I'm, in, I'm adding new metrics, number of emails and calls, and measure engagement of clients. And as I work in order to target the right companies, in order to make sure I address them, I'm gonna identify those. Then once I have identified them, I'm gonna qualify, pre-qualify. I'm gonna do that by doing research. And the research that I'm doing on is I'm learning from the existing demos I provided. Now look at again, I'm gonna go to the left or to the right, key performance indicators. Prospects identified, prospects qualified, prospects research. These are all become a key performance indicators. Look at the list that is growing. Now I'm gonna reach out to those people, number of emails and call sent. Does this start to feel familiar? Did you start to see this is a volume-based outbound organization? Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to make sure that I measure the number of meetings set. So I'm going to outreach and I'm going to make sure that the discoveries are set. What some of you found out is that, hey, if I don't research, if I just start spamming my clients with volume of, of leads, I'm just spamming them with emails. I don't need to research. I don't need to identify. I'm just giving them, 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 them emails. And so I, I skip the identification and research. I just, as I reach out to them, I qualify them when they respond to me. I only spend time with them when they approach me, right? And then I qualify. Now what I'm doing is, what we found is by inserting, or what the world found, by inserting an automatic calendaring tool link in there. Why do I even have a qualification? Dude, if you want to discover me, meet, let's go do it. So this approach has created, I no longer need to look at the engagement or volume of MQLs, I'm just looking at the amount of meetings set. Now, while I do that, you know, my salespeople are now responsible for, for you know, like getting that commitment for the logos one. And what you see down here is a typical outbound, improper, not the right way kind of sales organization with key performance indicators, how many emails per calls per week, how many meetings set, and how many deals won. And then we're gonna add an incentive program for this in order to make this even worse, okay? Now, look, this is outdated. We may as well you know, put you know, like this kind of music to it, okay? I just wanna let it sit in, how we went through that. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip through it, okay? As you listen to the music, I'm gonna, I'm gonna replay this, okay? You see, it keeps going wrong again and again. I can literally hit rewind and do it again, then we end up at the same result, okay? This, for most organizations, won't work. Okay, so we need something new for that. And that's, you know, like that is what the program that we are seeing more and more today, the things that we work on in an effort to improve, okay? So that is a clear, noticeable thing. And many of you who are at this point and go like, yeah, yeah, he, he, he. yeah, I hear you. I hear you. It is painful. Yes, yes, yes. We'll get through it though, don't worry. We're all here. It's gonna get better. 
Now, what we're going to see with the new GTM approach is in think of content-led growth, product-led growth, or research-led growth, where we're really targeting, right? You'll see that those organizations actually increase the effort. And so our, with a content-led growth, think of that as word of mouth. We are targeting content. And as clients engage with that con uh, content, they're gonna come in as an inbound. That inbound acts and behave as a self-qualification. They research the content. Because they come inbound, the calendaring function now takes place semi-automatically. It could be a response via an email, it could be automatic, but they are interested, they qualify. This is what we see, for example, product-led growth organizations, why they are doing this really well. In this case, is it assisted product-led growth where a lead comes in and an inside sales wrap up, pick up the process, but that is not needed. We see more and more that this process, if the client really wants to buy, and if the commitment is within a re within reason, they will go through the entire process. And it automatically creates and gave room to the product-led growth group. Now, product-led growth and content-led growth go really well hand-in-hand, -hand, meaning I have lots of interesting content that is driving people to take a look at the product. These two are like two peas in a pod. That is how we can look at all these volume and conversion metric and how we can now explain things, measure and see why we are doing certain things and how we have to create certain performance indicators or do the wrong thing, create the wrong performance indicators and cause the wrong action. Right now what I'm doing is advanced. It is what most of you will not do. Not in a while, but it's so fun. Sorry, I'm just having fun. Sorry. Let's get back, Jocko! Get back! Stay on track! Okay, last and final one. This is the fun part. This is the payoff. This is where the future goes. This is where in five years, 10 years, 50 years from now, what I aspire, what I dream, what I hope with my entire heart, how we are gonna teach sales at a university level, okay? You know, like we're not gonna teach closing and outbound cold call, and that is not gonna be a skill that we need, you know, like graduate level uh, interest. Okay, what we see down here is in this case, we're going to define win rate as a conversion, in this case, from a sales qualified lead into a win. I'm gonna keep it simple. What we see here are two cases. Rob, who turns in 30 SQLs, and it turns them into 10 deals per quarter with 20 day sales cycle. And we're going to compare that against, in this particular case, um, uh, with a win rate of 33%, sales cycle of 20 days, with an average MRR of new, new level of MRR of $50,000. If we compare it against Mary, Mary turns 30 SQLs into six deals, significantly fewer. Therefore, her win rate is 20%. She also has a sales, a sales, cycle, a sales price of 5K, but she uses a few more days, 28 days. So if you see right now, if you have to fire one, or if you have to say like, hey, I, I can only keep one of them, most people would keep, based on standard volume metrics and, and conversion metrics, volume metrics being, in this case, Rob generates more MRR and has a better win rate and his sales cycle is shorter. Based on these three metrics I gave you, you're gonna say, hey, we gotta keep Rob. And so we're gonna let go of Mary. This, however, proves not to be the case. Because if we now start taking into account what happened to the churn at the back end, we see that Rob actually, his churn, he churned 50% of all the deals. That means half of his deals churned. That means that the new MR per month was reduced to $25,000. And, but on the other hand, in this you know, like phantom case, Mary's uh, 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 deal did not turn. Why? Mary spent a little bit more time with them, listened more and made sure that the deals she closed, that she got commitment on, essentially resulted in those clients actually wanting it. 
And here, therefore, the case is Mary should not be let go either. I'm not saying one or the other. I'm just making a point down here is both are doing something good. We, we still like that that Rob, you know, turns a lot of deals, but we may want to tune that. And we may want to tune as well Mary that she closes a little faster so that both are within reason. But it points out to you that there is a metric. What happens here is we are comparing two conversion rates. Two. Dos. Un. Deux. Een, twee in Dutch. Een, twee. Two. Two conversion metrics. And when we compare them against each other, we're going to get performance metrics. I'm going to explain this in detail because this, folks, this is like the world of growth for the next, like I said, decade worth of sales processes. What we see down here is I'm going to take that conversion rate for, which is the win rate. I'm going to put that on that axis and I'm going to put the win rate, the churn on that horizontal axis. OK, this creates a two by two. Now, <coughs> what I'm going to do in this two by two, I'm going to assume an average contract value of twenty four thousand dollars. Now I'm going to go into my benchmark data, which I copied here for ease of understanding. And I'm going to say at twenty four thousand dollars, it fits in the bracket of ACV 20K. In that, I now know that my conversion rate, I'm going to pull that out of there in that benchmark. And it says on average, that middle line should be at 22 percent. So I'm going to enter that 22 percent in there. Now I'm going to get what is below average. Oh, well, below 22 percent. So, you know, 10 percent. And what is above average? 30 percent. Right. So I now know there's something below and something above. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say it's like, hey, that conversion rate number four, I'm going to point that it came in what we measured our conversion rate, you know, phantom created here, not reality, but phantom is, hey, we had a conversion rate ourselves of 18 percent. That is what we measured. We have a win rate. We win one out of approximately every five deals. And so what we see now here is that that fits below average. What I'm now going to do, I'm going to take a look at our churn metrics. How much of these clients are properly onboarded? Well, we see that seven out of 100 clients, you know, like they stop being onboarded. They exit out of the onboarding process and they want their money back. In return metrics, that therefore is 93%, 7% churn on an annual platform. Now, what I see here is that the norm at that price is 96%. And so I'm going to fill in 96%. I'm going to say we're at 93%. So as I put in 93%, it shows me I am below average. I'm below average on my I churn and therefore I am not doing good. And I'm below average on my win rate. So I'm sitting into that quadrant. Now I know where I'm at. Let that sit in. I know this because of the benchmark and because of the metrics and of the data, because we're all measuring the same data, we can now compare with each other. I can now compare apples to apples, so to speak. Now, what you'll see is I'm now going to turn like what you think was, you know, I started off with magic, right? And how bad magic was. I'm now going to turn science and magic. They're the same thing, but science is real. Okay. It's like magic, but it's real. Okay. So what I'm going to do down here. I want to pick to you what I can do right now. This is like, I hope you enjoyed this as much learning from this as I love sharing it with you. If I know that the below average win rate and the below average conversion rate fits in that scenario, then I now know what to do there. I can establish over time that if I, my win rate is low and my retention is low, that I need to look at having a go to market problem first because I'm not winning the right deals. Potentially, are we selling into the right market? Are we are we promoting the right impact we offer? If we're not, we're going to see that we're in this category. So I'm going to point upstream and say like, hey, folks, we are having a problem that our pipeline sourcing is not coming from the right kind of clients. And that is most likely it happens a lot. Oh, we just went to a trade show and we got a whole bunch of like flaky leads in there that you know went to the pipeline. And as they the proverbial, uh, the S word in the funnel leads to S word coming out of the funnel. Now, if I look further to the right, I see that retention is still below average, but I'm winning above average. That means like, hey, I'm winning a lot of deals, but I'm winning a little bit too many. Like what we saw with Rob being the case. We're winning the wrong kind of deals. Clients seems to be in a hurry, if, which is a customer success problem. Or they have buyer's remorse. They didn't really bought what they wanted. And so I know what to do there. 
if I look at scenario three, we have a below average win rate and we have an, uh, uh, an, uh, a, you know, a good to, to, uh, retention, below average uh, retention, we see that we're winning the right customers, but not enough. It all comes down to here to the right. And it says like, hey, if we are having successful churn and so on, that is what we really want. We want to get to that scenario four. That creates four scenarios. These four scenarios can be compared not only in this specific case, but they can be compared in all kinds of, I can measure MQLs against win rate. I can measure handoff of the SDR against the win rate and so on. I can see things. These are all different performance metrics that will tell me what I need to do in the process. So if I, if I occur in that situation, then this is the most likely outcome I need to take. The reason I say all this, I dropped earlier on the word artificial intelligence. The moment in time I create these closed loop systems because that's what they're doing, I essentially be ready for artificial intelligence. This allows the growth in the future. That to me, we can now like, I can teach this, you can measure this, we can repeat this, we can improve this, we can do so many things with this. This is just the opening of all the things we can do. The entire world is open to us, okay? Where do we go from? Where do we go from here? So, in summary, no one can save us, save us from here's your data model. Just measure, think of this data model. This allows you to rethink all your ways, y'all, like measure the right thing, do the right thing, convert the right thing. And that was it for the data model. I just want to see you on my new grave. Next one up is the mathematical model. We will launch this. I have it already created. I just need to create a video around it, but I have all the material ready. Give me a one week to two weeks and we'll launch this. excited that I can share this with you. I'm looking forward and hope that you are as excited to have as much fun with me as I'm having given it to you. And with that, I want to let you go. I want to wish you a happy, happy time. I want to thank you all for being here and looking forward to see you on the next session. Come on.